Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Friday night study. Uh, we're continuing our study of A.T. Jones, the Third Angel's Message from the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And uh, Before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have here this evening and for the Sabbath that's coming. Um, we ask, Lord, that you can bless each person who's preparing for the Sabbath and has been preparing all week, our hearts, and, um, and searching our hearts. We just pray, Lord, that you can help us on this Sabbath to receive the blessing you have prepared for us. We know, Lord, that uh, we live in this world of sin and we need this time with you on the Sabbath. Be with us in this study. May your Holy Spirit uh, direct our minds and that we can, that you can bring the things to our remembrance that we need and that you can bring us light uh, that will lighten the dark corners of our minds and hearts. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so uh, this is presentation number nine, uh, the third angel's message. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Angela. And um, now, uh, this study here, he's going to start getting into some of the nitty gritty. He's going to start moving from this area of what's happening in the world and what it means, because he's talking here in the, in the previous message about uh, being separate from the world. And... Uh, to understand how that happens, how to call people out of Babylon. Now, often we just think about these, these systems of the world, you know, the, the Catholic Church, the Protestants, uh, the globalists, whatever, spiritualism, however we want to uh, describe it. Um, but we don't often think about what that really means so he's going to start moving into that. Um, so he begins here. There is another a very important thing that I must notice with the division of the subject. It is a thing that is going to force every Seventh-day Adventist and every other Christian to a decision between Christ and this world and between allegiance to Christ and connection with the United States government. It is a proposition endorsed by all the governors of all the states and territories of the United States to drill in military tactics all the schoolboys in the public schools. Some of the governors in the states where the legislatures are in session are already trying to get legislation enacting laws providing for it. The meeting in favor of the project was held in New York City the 25th of January, in which speeches were made. Let the United States government and all the states undertake to drill in military drills. So he's, he's quoting, filling with the war spirit, or maybe he's not quoting, um, not sure. But it says, filling with the war spirit, all the children of the country. Okay, yeah, so he's not quoting. So he's just saying, let the United States government and all the states undertake to drill in military drill. Filling with the war spirit all the children of the country, and what Christian can allow his children to take any part in it? And if the evil thing shall be made compulsory or shall be required by law, then what Christian can allow his children to be in the schools anymore? The word that ushered Christ into the world was peace on earth. This thing is precisely what it says in Joel prepare war. Are you ready for the issue? The scheme is on foot and has spread over all the country like a flash of wildfire. It has been taken up as though it were the grandest thing that ever was from the day it was mentioned. It has been greedily grasped and is proposed at once to fix it in the law. Whether this military drill, this inculcating of the war spirit into all the children of the country shall be made, a compuls made compulsory at the first or not the doing of it at all is enough, for the simple introduction and practice will make the thing in a sense compulsory, for the simple reason that any boy that would refuse to take part in it would be called a coward, 
by those who did take part in it. He would be ostracized. His schoolmates would pass him by on the other side. For all this is to be done with the in, with, in the interests of patriotism. And it is said to be all for the inculcating of patriotism and love of the flag. Any boy that will refuse to take part in the military exercise will be declared unpatriotic and he will be despising the flag. It will be said he does not love the country and is a traitor. But no Christian parent can allow his child to be filled with the war spirit. It is with the spirit of Christ, the spirit of peace, that he must be filled. It is to Christ that his allegiance is owed. Now, uh, regarding military service, we know that the church um, definitely has fallen on this point. Um, and we know when uh, we know about, of course, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement, uh, which uh, began in Germany, what we call the German Reformers sometimes, German Reform Movement, Seventh-day Adventist German Reform Movement. Uh, a lot of that was over uh, military service. Adventists have uh, really, we would say that we're pacifists. Um, and, and yet, you know, that really isn't, isn't the case for most Adventists. There are many Adventists who, who have joined in the military, and the church seems rather proud of it. But anyway, um, this is certainly true. And that being so, it brings a test that will separate every Christian child and every Christian parent from the government of the United States and every state. Then is it not time we begin to be separated anyway? Were the lessons last week too extreme? Did they go too far when they said, let us cut loose? My brethren, the very events from the side of the enemy are forcing us right up to the line where we have to decide between allegiance to Jesus Christ and, and this world. Uh, but there stands that wicked thing right before every Seventh-day Adventist and every other Christian in the United States. It will be a test as to whether he will let every earthly thing go and hold only to Christ. Let them call him what they choose. That is the test. It is only another note sounded in the one universal call, come out of her, my people. But where did the mischievous thing start? This particular phrase, a phase of it, as to putting it in the public school, started with the papacy. Professed Protestant churches have been organizing what they call boys, boys brigades for two summers. But the first step that I found toward putting it into the public schools and forcing it upon the people of the country was by the Catholic Club of Jersey City, New Jersey, as reported by the Catholic Mirror of October 6, 1894. The Catholic Club, Club of Newark, New Jersey, at its meeting last Wednesday night, adopted a set of resolutions asking the legislature to make provision for the introduction of military drill in the public, the parochial, and the other schools within the state for which boys are taught. The res resolutions are as follows. Resolved that in the judgment of the Catholic Club of Newark, New Jersey, the military resources of our country should not now be neglected, but should be developed as fully as a reasonable economy will allow. And uh, be it resolved that we therefore suggest respectfully to the legislature of our state that military instruction for the boys in our public schools ought to be provided for and may without a doubt be secured very cheaply through the agency of the members of the state. And be it resolved that we also suggest to the legislature the propriety of providing the similar for similar instruction in all the other schools in the state in which boys are taught. And be it resolved that a copy of these resolutions be forwarded to the clerk of the Senate and another to the clerk of the House of the Assembly. It is hoped that such a plan will come and vote, as it will be of great benefit to the boys in many Many ways. Lafayette Post of the Grand Army of the Republic of New York City, the one which started the movement to put the flag on every schoolhouse, has lately taken it up and has spread it abroad to the whole country. Now look further at the situation. Everyone that protests against that will be accused of being unpatriotic. And on the other hand, the papacy will simply crowd herself forward as the most patriotic of all, because she can endorse it to the fullest measure. She can show that she is the most prominent in the movement and in favor of it. Thus, this is simply another means by which the papacy will set herself at the head of everything 
and will rule over all. Here's a dispatch from the Detroit Evening News of February 4, 1895, relating to the military drill in the churches, which is an illustration of the evil thing, whether in the public schools or in the apostate churches. So before we look at that, now, obviously, this situation isn't exactly the same as today. But what would be the parallel to this? Where we see the papacy in the lead. Uh, it's obviously a different time in which we live. Probably maybe in politics. How about leading in this situation um, with global warming or with the coronavirus? Yeah, so we would look at things like the environment. Whatever, whatever the fashion is of the day, uh, the papacy wants to be in the lead, uh, whatever the issues that, that people think are important. Um, and, but all of them are contrary to God's word. Now, some people might have a hard time you know, thinking that, well, environmentalism is contrary to God's word, right? The idea of you know global warming, we got to take care of our planet. And I know many Adventists who who think it's a good thing, you know, that we need to uh, take care of our planet. We need to cut down our CO two, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, obviously, it would generally be more liberal Adventists that would see things that way. Um, but remember, Jones is in a parallel to our time. Now, we could also look at things like, because right now, we're, what we're seeing is, a, is an attack on the United States. Back then, it was patriotism in the name of patriotism that they were uh, doing this. But we see things like Black Lives Matters. Is the papacy at all interested in things like that? I would say, yeah, we got their hand in everything. Yeah. And, and these are, you know, these social justice ideas, these are definitely supported by the papacy. And, 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 and economically, the papacy is, is socialistic in its views. It believes that the state should take from the rich and give to the poor. Right? That charity should be forced by the state rather than voluntarily. Okay, so he's going to go on and read this about uh, this article about the United Boys Brigade. Um, but I don't know if I really want to read all of this. Uh, it's, um, so it's just going to talk about this. So this is details that you know we really don't. Um, okay, so uh, where does he? Where does that end though? Okay, anyway, we'll just start here. Babylon embraces the world, and separation from Babylon means nothing but separation from the world. And these things are so near to us, and the separation so near to be forced upon everyone who will be loyal to Jesus Christ. All this proclaims the all-urgent necessity that we seek God with all the heart, and let our hearts be separated, and we separated in heart unto God holy. So the real problem here is things being forced upon us to go against our consciences, whatever those things be. Um, so, Women's, women being pastors. Yeah, but that's not forced by the state. Okay, here are a few clippings in which the military movement is discussed, which are worth reading. One from New York Recorder, endorsing it fully throughout, says. Right, so... Military drill in the schools is evidently foreordained. How much has been done already in this line and how much more may be done was amply demonstrated by the exhibition given in the 7th Regiment Armory the other day, where not only the boys, but the girls acquitted themselves with signal credit. Right? And then another uh, uh, clipping as well. Um, I wish they had these things in quotes. Um, so they go on about the benefit. 
So Jones says, but it is not all that way. There are some opposing voices heard. One man writing to the Chicago Herald, February 3rd or 4th, speaks in this way. I notice in an evening paper of recent date an article concerning the enrollment of boys into a church military organization for the purpose of fostering the war spirit and the proverbial meekness of the lowly Nazarene. Um, can anything be more stultifying, contradictory, or grotesque than this? When the boy's education is finished in this new school, what a peculiar product he will be. What a laughable combination of saint and devil. What an impossible mixture of right and wrong. What a commentary on the Christian church, whose mission is supposed to be the inauguration of a reign of universal peace. What a confession of weakness. What a despicable trick to fill empty pews. What an insult to the memory of that noblest of characters, Jesus, whose life, acts, and teachings were the exact reverse of this. If this is Christianity, what in the name of religion is paganism? So uh, these church military organizations and their utter disregard for consistency, decency, genuine morality, real justice, and in fact, all of the Christian virtues have no parallel in history. And the men who engineer this game, for it is only that, are the worst enemies of true democracy and Republican institutions possible to imagine um, and Republican institutions possible to imagine. This may sound radical to some, but it is true. And truth is only radical to the person unacquainted with it. There are many such, alas, too many. Here's a paper in which is printed the annual address of Mrs. Marion H. Dunham of Burlington, Iowa, of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She has some excellent remarks upon this, speaking of the increasing conflicts among the laboring classes, capital and labor and so on, she says, one feature has developed which can well excite the alarm of all who love their country, and that is the cultivation of the military spirit and military, military, military training. Then, speaking of dangers enough in the regular course of governmental affairs, she continues, by far more serious than all of these is the fact that in a time of profound peace threatened by no other nation, our, our position and power making, uh, power making us, in fact, impregnable to all attacks from any possible hostile power. Our schools and our churches are turned into military camps, and our young boys are drilled with arms that have been used on the battlefield, and the thirst for shedding the blood of their fellow men aroused in their young hearts. In my own city, that's Burlington, Iowa, the girls who are serving as substitute teachers are called cadets and they were cadetti, in order apparently to familiarize, familiarize them with military terms and ideas that even womanly influence shall not be exerted for peace. Our colleges are supplied with instructors by and at the expense of the government, and the boys' brigade of the churches, which are supposed to be organized to spread the gospel of peace on earth, goodwill to men, numbers about 115,000, and the old Sunday school hymn of I want to be an angel with the angel stand changed to um, I want to be a soldier and with the soldier stand, a cap upon my forehead and a rifle in my hand. I want to drill for service with military skill and master modern uh, tactics, the most approved to kill. And it goes on and gives a revamping of that old hymn and continues. No foes from abroad menace us that this preparation is needed. And whatever this movement means or portends, it is contrary to the spirit of Christianity. It is turning civilization backward to the time when might was right and every man's hand was raised against every other. Um, so it's interesting that phrase dealing with Ishmael. But this we can learn, from this we can learn another thing. And that is the real Christians minds of the country will turn away from this and protest against it. And that only opens wider the door for sounding aloud the cry. Come out of her, my people. Those who are favorable to Christianity and want to see the spirit of peace spread, you can see for yourself that this movement in itself repels them and indeed shuts them out. It draws the line between them and the government. And just now, God has a work in the earth, a message to be spread calling upon all who would save their souls alive to separate utterly 
from all such evil things, to set themselves against it with all their hearts, and turning to God in the spirit of peace, they all, from the least to the greatest, may know him who is our peace. Here, then, is the situation as it is today on all sides. Every element of the world, whether in the papacy, in apostate Protestantism, or on the part of the government itself, everything is driving us right to the point where we are compelled to decide and separate from the world and all that is in it. Well then, shall we not look at it from the side of God's truth and have his spirit, which will indeed separate us and clothe us which, with such power as will awake the world to danger and save from the impending ruin, ruin every soul who will be saved. Here's the word, Isaiah 40, verse 9, reading the margin. O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, get thee up into the high mountain. O thou that tellest good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Thus saith, thus the Lord says to us in this time, get up into the high mountains and lift up your voice with all your strength. And do not be afraid. Tell to the people, behold your God. He is your refuge. He is your salvation. He is your protection. Now let us turn again to study of what it is to come out of Babylon. Right? So Jones here is, has set up, you know, obviously a situation that we don't have today. But we can see the parallels. We definitely can see uh, how that we are tied to the institutions of this world in various different ways to the philosophies of this world. So now he's going to talk what it means to come out of Babylon. And he's been studying this, but he's getting deeper into it. Um, everyone knows now that to come out of Babylon is to come out of the world and to separate from Babylon is to separate from the world. What we want to know next is what is it to come out of the world? What is it to separate from the world? Galatians Galatians 1 verse 4 will answer that question in a word. We shall have to read the third and fourth verses together to get the connection. But the fourth verse is the one that has the point in it. Uh, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That's pretty clear, actually, when you think about it, right? Um, because to come out of Babylon, to come out of the world, we have to be delivered from this present evil world. It's not something we can just do. We have to be delivered from it. So Jones goes on, he, as he gave himself for our sins in order to deliver us from this present evil world, it follows plainly enough that connection with the present evil world and even the evil world itself, lies in our sinfulness. And therefore, to deliver us from this world, we must be delivered from sin. Not from some particular sins, but from sin itself. The thing, the root, the all of it. The word of God does not take a man and find out how much of good there is in him, and how much bad there is in him, and then patch the good on the places of the badness and take him into heaven that way. You should not put a new patch on an old garment. Christ said so, and it is so. Then we are not to see how much good there is in us, how many good traits we have, and give ourselves credit for these, and then get enough goodness from the Lord to supply whatever we may lack. No, there is no goodness, not one good thing there at all. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. From the crown of the head to the feet, there is no soundness in it. But instead, there are wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7, 24. It is a body of death simply because it is a body of sin. Romans 6, 6. To be delivered from sin, then, is to be delivered from ourselves and that is what it is 
to come out of Babylon. Many people have been getting the idea that if they get out of the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Catholic Church and get into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, then you're out of Babylon. Now, of course, we could add many people now would say, get out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, get away from all those people who don't believe or think like you. You don't dress right. You don't, you know, accept the things that, that Adventism was founded upon. And that somehow that means we're out of Babylon. But Jones says, no, that is not enough. Unless you are converted, unless you are separated from this world, you are not out of Babylon, even though you are a Seventh-day Adventist in the Seventh-day Adventist church and in the tabernacle in Battle Creek, or even if you're in this study. This is not saying that the Seventh-day Adventist church is Babylon. That is not it at all. But the man who is, connect, who is connected with himself is connected with the world, and the world is Babylon. You have separated from sin, separated from this world, to be out of Babylon, having a form of godliness without the power, is simply another expression which describes Babylon and her condition in the last days. That being so, if I, a Seventh-day Adventist, have the form of godliness without the power, I belong to Babylon. No difference what I call myself. I am a Babylonian. I have on the Babylonish garment. I bring Babylon into the church wherever I go. Now, Heidi and I have been reading five testimonies. And uh, uh, the part that we've been reading in five testimonies, um, I'm just going to reference it. I'm not going to read it here. Um, but I'll just tell you what it was, and, and anybody who who's interested could look at it. Um, it's probably one of the most um, direct uh, calls in the spirit of prophecy for purity. And its uh, section is... in section two. Well, there's a whole section in uh, its uh, testimony number 32. And just trying to figure that what there's all these different subtitles. Here it is. I think it's this section called uh, Warnings and Reproofs, Chapter 10, Dangers to the Young. Um, there's a whole bunch of sections, Agents of Satan, so, lots here. Jealousy and false fighting, the day of the Lord. But this one in particular has to do with purity. And let's see if I can find it. Yeah, so this is this section. It starts on page uh, Dangers of the Young. That's it. It starts on page 121. And... Um, there's there's a whole bunch of things in five testimonies. It's it's um, I recommend that people read it. Um, but anyway, when we're looking at the problem that we see in the church, uh, the problem is sin. Okay, and, and uh, Samuel puts a note here. Some people can read that body of sin and take it as that sin is our nature, which it is not. Now, 
So this is a good point. Sin is the transgression of the law of God, right? So we know that um, there is a nature that we have that we call, the Bible calls sinful human nature. And everyone has a similar sinful human nature. Christ, when he took upon humanity, he took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. But he did not the least participate in sin. So just having a sinful nature is, is not enough to make you a sinner. You have to sin to be a sinner, right? I think that's your point, Samuel. Um, so some people think that if we just get a new body, then we can stop sinning. But we know that Adam did not have a sinful nature, yet he sinned. Right? Eve did not have a sinful nature, yet she sinned. So we don't sin because we have a sinful nature. Jesus had a sinful nature, but did not sin. Okay. So thanks for bringing up that point. And Jones is going to make this very clear in this series of articles. So that's um, an important point. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to know that um, if we are sinning, we can make excuse for our sins. That is, we, we have some sins that we, we've overcome, at least we believe that we have. We don't do those things. And, and so we're not a sinner, right? That is, we've overcome in those areas and we can trust that, well, I don't smoke or I don't drink. And I, maybe I used to smoke or drink. Um, or I've just never even done those things. I've never committed adultery or, or things like that. And yet we can be a sinner because there's other sins that we ignore, that we excuse in our own behavior. We can excuse gossip, backbiting. We can excuse judging others and considering ourselves better than others. And so we have no conception of how far we are from God and how unchristlike we are. And so this is a problem. We can have a form of godliness, especially when we profess a high standard and, and, and a high standard of doctrine and belief and, and also of action in some areas of life, but ignore other areas of life where, where we don't want to overcome. So Jones goes on. Another word upon this is in Galatians. Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. All of this world that ever can cripple a man or hinder him in his heavenly course is simply what is inside of him. It is simply what there is of him. Therefore, when Christ would deliver a man from this present evil world, he simply delivers him from sin and from himself. Then that man is in the kingdom of God. He is in the world, but not of the world. So Jesus says, I've chosen you out of the world. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. Very good. Here I am. Suppose I am of the world. Then the world will love his own. That is, the world that is in me and of me will love the world and will cling to the world. It cannot do anything else. And I cannot do anything else because I'm essentially of the world itself. The world outside of me and around me will love his own. That is true. But as certainly as I am of the world, so certainly I will stick to the world and love the world. And the world within me will love and cling to the world without. I may be calling myself a Christian at the same time. But that will not alter the case. The world will love his own. If in heart I am cut loose from this world, I am free from it. But if the world is there, I will love the world. And when the test comes, when the crisis comes, I will surrender to the world and go the way of the world in general. Stay in Babylon and worship the beast. Now turn to the third chapter of 2 Timothy. There we have the same thing taught. This I know also, 
that in the last day perilous last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves from such turn away then if i am a lover of my my own self from such i am to turn away but who is it i am to turn away from self assuredly come out of babylon from such turn away it is not that i am to look at you and study you and see whether you are a lover of your own self to see whether you are covetous and a boaster and proud and that i separate from you not at all it is not for me to look at others and say oh i don't want to be in, in a church with such brethren as these i cannot be the right kind of christian there i think i will better go to oakland and join the church there or I think I would better go to Battle Creek and join the church there. The brethren here at home seem to be so kind of, I can hardly describe it, but it's very unpleasant and very hard to be a Christian here. I think I will have to leave this church and join some other one. And that will not answer at all. For unless you are genuinely converted and separated from the world, when you have done all that the church which you have joined is just so much worse than it was before, and so much more Babylonish by just so much as you are there. From such turn away. Then as I am to turn away from myself, where does Babylon lie? Where does... Um, where does the world lie? Altogether in self, just as we found in Galatians, fourth chapter. Let us look at the third chapter of 2 Timothy a little further and see whether any of us are there. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous. Can you tell what it is that will cause a man who professes to belong to the Lord and to love the Lord? What will cause him to hold back from the Lord that which the Lord says definitely belongs to him? The tithe, for instance. Here are means that come into my hands. The Lord says that a tenth of, of that is his. I profess to love the Lord. I go to meeting every Sabbath. I profess to belong to the Lord myself. I profess to be consecrated. But yet I do not let the Lord have what belongs to him. What is the root of that thing? Self. And what is the first fruit of self? Covetousness. I have not stolen anything from my neighbor or kept anything back from him, but I've held to that which belongs to the Lord, and I am to turn away from my covetous self. Blasphemers, we cannot each one of we cannot take each one of these in detail. Boasters, proud, blasphemers. A blasphemer, in the common acceptation of the term, is one who uses the name of God profanely, one who takes the name of God in vain. One of the commandments of God is set against that, but Though I do not by the word of mouth use the name of God profanely, if I profess the name of God, if I have taken it upon me, and then I take such a course as to show that the whole thing is in vain, that I have not taken the name of the Lord, then have I not taken the name of the Lord in vain? Assuredly, I have. If it is a form of godliness without the power, is not it a vain taking of the name of the Lord? And will I not, by such a course, cause other people to blaspheme the name of the Lord? Then as I profess to be the Lord's, and yet take a course which, in the nature of things, causes the name of the Lord to be blasphemed, the blasphemy begins with me. There is a verse, verse which we might read upon that in 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. Let us... Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. There, the word of God itself lays the truth right home to the individual, that he is to take such a course as that the name of God and his doctrine shall not be blasphemed, that we are to guard the name and the doctrine of God from blasphemy. But if I sanction it, if I draw it in, I draw it on, then it is certain that the blasphemy begins with me. I've taken the name of God in vain and wear it in vain. 
Here's another test, Romans 2, beginning in the, with the 17th verse. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and maketh thy boast of God, and knoweth his will. Thou therefore, which teacheth another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, Thou that teachest a man should not steal. What are you doing? Are you cheating? Do you drive sharp bargains? And if you should happen to be in charge of some of his business, are you ready to drive a sharp bargain for the Lord? Do you think that is integrity to the cause? No, it is dishonesty. It is devilry. I cannot be selfish for the Lord. This is not saying that we are not to be careful and economical. But it is saying that we cannot drive sharp bargains for the Lord any more than for myself and yet be honest. Therefore, thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Or are you honest? Thou that sayest that a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Do you hold the marriage relation sacred? Do you honor that, that ordinance? Or it is or is it to you such a thing as has been entirely too common among our young men especially, and even those preparing for the ministry too, who seem to think so lightly of this solemn ordinance of God that they can go and engage themselves to some young woman that may strike their fancy at the first, and then seeing some other one that strikes their fancy a little stronger, break their engagement. And then, if they do not uh, get married before they find another one, they are ready to repeat this course. Now, of course, it's much worse than what he's talking about here. Uh, the seventh commandment is put in the law of God to guard the marriage institution, the marriage ordinance, and men cannot disregard the marriage institution, that solemn ordinance of God, without violating the commandment. In a single year, I could put my finger on at least half a dozen young men, professed Christians, who had engaged themselves to young ladies and every one of them broke their engagement and married somebody else because they had more fancy for the new one. And some of these were preparing for the work of the Lord. I want to know whether it is a fit preparation for the work of the Lord to trample underfoot one of God's most sacred ordinances at the first step. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Do you honor God's commandments? Do you honor his ordinances? Well, says one, would you have a man marry a woman he does not love? No, I would not. But I would have him know what love is and know what he is about before he engages himself to a woman. In, in this course that I'm describing, there is no love to start with. It is mere aimless fancy. The woman may be perfectly honest in it. It may be love on her part, and in most cases it is. But on his part, it is mere fancy. And if it should so happen that the marriage should be performed before another one strikes his fancy, a little more forcibly than does the first, someday he will meet one that does, and then he is not sure of his position. Any man that will violate the sacred confidence that he has pledged in that way to one woman is never sure that he will be faithful to another woman. When he has trampled underfoot that sacred thing, which God has stored most happiness for human beings as such, he has no surety, even to himself, that he will be faithful in any other case of the like kind. But what of the man, anyway, who will go so far as to win the love of a woman to betray it? The Bible, in speaking of the mutual love of two men, find its strongest illustration in describing it as passing the love of women. And yet a man will win that and have her love bound about him and then ruthlessly break all its tendrils and trample it underfoot. It is a violation of the seventh commandment. It is trampling underfoot the institution which that commandment guards, and in taking steps which, if carried to their logical conclusion, only a few steps, will lead to the actual fact. Let me say again, I would not have anyone marry a person whom he does not love, but I would have every soul have sufficient reverence for the ordinance of God, sufficient sobriety and thoughtfulness as a Christian to know his own feelings. I would have him possess sufficient sense to know what he is doing, to find out before God what love is before he enters this most solemn relation 
with its sacred obligations. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? That is the question. Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? But you say, I don't worship sticks and stones. I don't bow down to graven images. No, you don't. But how about the fashions of the world? What kind of hat is that that you have on? What kind of cane is it, is it that you carry? What kind of dress is it that you cut and make? Why do you cut and make it the way you do? Is it because it is more comfortable that way? Is it because it is more pleasing to God that way? No. You know that, that it is rather because it is nearer to the fashion that way. You know that it is because it conforms more to the world and will suit the world's ways better. But this world is vanity. It is idolatry. Satan is the god of this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Whosoever would be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Therefore, although I may not bow down to graven images, although I may not worship sticks and stones, yet if I follow the fashions, the ways, and the things of this world, and conform to the ways of the world rather than ask God what he would have, then what am I worshiping? The God of the There is idolatry also. There is enmity against God. I know of nothing more incongruous, more unreasonable, anyhow, than fashion, wanting everybody shaped on the same mold and cut the same way and look just the same way. Why did not God make us all alike when he made us? Why did he make us, why did he not make us all just exactly alike? Fashion's way is precisely the devil's way. He wants to make everybody of the same cut in religion. And so he must have that so fashionable that all will wear it and then have the government take it up and fix it in the law and demand that all shall wear this fashionable cut of religion. And all this concession to fashion and dress is simply training yourself to make concessions to the world's religion. Now, and, and, and this point should be well taken, right? That is... Um, people want to fit in. But this is the problem, the basic problem I see with Seventh-day Adventists when I became an Adventist is, and we've talked about this before, but Adventists don't like to be called a cult. They don't like to be seen as odd. Uh, and part of the problem with dress is to dress oddly, um, to stand out, differently um, to some people they just won't do it right they want to fit in you know one of the things I, I used to do lots of door to door selling my albums and the thing that I noticed that was rather interesting is how much people looked alike that is um, sometimes you would think that you would just come to a house that you had already just been at uh, you know half an hour earlier because the woman looks the same she has the same haircut has the same clothes everything looks the same now i'm not saying that we should try to dress odd just to look odd but we need to know why we dress the way we do why we do everything the way that we do is it just to fit in are we thinking about what other people will think of me if i do this or that if i take this position on some issue, because many people in the world take a position on an issue because it's popular, not because they have any conviction whether it's right or wrong, but they will express an opinion, and they'll express, uh, express that opinion strongly, knowing that if they do so, they will be accepted by those around them. But if they're with a different group of people, they might not express that opinion at all because they don't really hold that opinion. They just hold opinions in order to appear acceptable to whoever they want to be acceptable to. So we can be in the company of Seventh-day Adventists and act a certain way. <clears throat> a group of conservative Adventists and act a certain way, but be with another group of people and act a completely different way. And, and that would mean that we're in Babylon. <clears throat> If God wanted to make us all look okay, what, okay, we read that part. Um, okay, if God wanted us all to look alike, 
to be alike and look alike? Why did he not make us all alike to begin with? Why? You sometimes see people with clothing upon them that it is in no sense becoming to them, but is utterly incongruous. They may have on a hat or a dress of color that make them look as if they were recovering from a fit of the jaundice, but that question is not thought of. All that they think is that such is the fashion now. Now, of course, we live in a time when people dress at what I would call costumes in, in the sense uh, you'll see people, they dress like cowboys. They want to be a cowboy. Another person wants to look like he's from uh, the 50s. Another person wants to look like he's from the 60s, looks like a hippie. You know, people dress all of these different ways to fit into whatever group they want to follow. So in the past, it used to be much more uh, homogenous, the, the view of what people would be to be worldly. But now it, it can vary quite a bit. You know, tattoos are very popular. Um, you know, it used to be at one time not socially acceptable to have a tattoo. But now, you know, Christians get tattoos, right? So people do whatever is, is, is going to get them to fit in, to be noticed by the group that they want to belong to. And that means they're in Babylon because we need to put on Christ. We need to be dressed as Christians and look as Christians in all that we do. Um, all that they think is that such is the fashion now. Now God has made us in the world so that no two of us are alike. Each one is himself. He has a personality, an individuality of his own. And the Lord intends each Christian to exert an influence in this world that no other person in this world can exert. He expects each one of us to dress that the way God has made him will be represented to the world in perfect harmony, perfect congruity to, in every respect, so that God can use the individuality which he has created for the purposes for which he has created it. Dress to suit the Lord. And then all there is about us will tell for God and the things of righteousness. But one can destroy all that God has made him or her for by professing to be a Christian and then expecting to exert an influence in the world by dressing according to the way of this world. It cannot be done. The two things will not work together at all. You cannot impress anybody in favor of Christianity in that way, because the whole thing through which the Lord would work is shut away by this tribute to idolatry. Dress the way the Lord would have you, and you will find that it is not expensive, nor will it require much workmanship or very much ingenuity, always to be neatly and becomingly dressed. Thou that abhorrest idols, Dost thou commit sacrilege? That is what I want to know. Is your mind upon God? Do you dress to please him? Are you seeking to please him? Or are you caring for what this one will say or what that one will say? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. One of the resigned reigning evils of the last days is that people professing godliness will be blasphemers. Are you one? Do you bear the name of the Lord in vain? From such, turn away. <clears throat> now, can we have a bit of a discussion about some of this? And Because we look at this situation. First, Jones has, has talked about... Um, Patriotism, and now he's talking about fashion. Now, and, and I meant people dress to fit into sort of a, a group. So you'll see people, they, they want it, they're, they're dressing up in a sense, not in a plain way. That is, they're representing what, what their value system is. Right, what what class they identify with, and you know one of the things I think about this, and, and people can comment on it if you have any thoughts on it. But one one of the things that, from how I grew up, 
is, is how my parents talked, the type of words they would use, and the types of things that they would talk about. So in my home, my parents never spoke ill of anyone. And so I was raised to believe that if you're a respectable person, you don't speak ill of others. We didn't use slang. My dad would not use slang terms. And so I grew up not using slang. Now, all around me, uh, in the neighborhood I grew up in, a fairly poor neighborhood, there was a lot of slang. There was a lot of swearing and cursing and talking about all kinds of things that I never heard talked about at home. And I could not participate in that type of conversation without, is I couldn't swear. I couldn't act differently than I was taught because I understood that that was how you are to be if you are a Christian, even though I wasn't a converted Christian yet. And I'm not saying that I was good or anything. It's just that was the value that I grew up with. The idea of, of, of using, you know, language that's laden with slang and swear words and things like that. To me, that just wouldn't be self-respecting. So one of the things that um, um, I came to understand, it's a long story, but um, in my experience was we exist in a world where people are trying to find an identity. Now, what is our identity? Now, Jones here talks about the individual, that individual personality that we're all unique. But how do we find our identity, our purpose? Well, through, through Christ. Okay. Now, if we think about in the Bible, we think about uh, Jacob. When he blessed his sons, what was he doing? Why did he bless his sons? Why did he prophesy upon them? What was he doing? Like, why did he talk about each of his sons and, and give these cryptic messages about them? What, what was he doing? Well, explaining their identity or something. Okay, so he's he's describing their character, and and their characters they have a good and a bad aspect, right? Right. It. I mean, we wouldn't call it a cursing because he's blessing his sons. He's giving them a blessing, but in that blessing, there's also a warning about the weaknesses of their nature. Would would, would that is that sort of a a good way to describe it. Yeah, I think so. And and our identity is in Christ. Now, when we identify when we place our identity in Christ, that is Christ gives us when we connect with him, he gives us a sense of purpose. He ex we're accepted in the beloved, right? And we can now have an identity that we don't have to put on some kind of fake identity. Now, for many, um, and you know, I can't judge individuals, but I can say in a general sense that there are many people who become Christians who don't put on Christ. That is, their, their identity is in the church or the people around them or their belief system. That they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. That is... They have no personal identity. And that would be the whole issue of fashion, which I think Jones is talking about here. So because people don't have their own identity, they try to find their identity in the world. And so today we see in this world of, of um, you know, gender affirmation, if you want to 
what they what they call gender affirmation, that um, people will become all kinds of things. In a sense, what we see with uh, transgenderism is simply a fashion that many people, especially young college women and, and teenagers, are are deciding that they can choose their gender only because it is fashionable. Right? We could say that none of these people, or almost none of them, 30 years ago, if they were alive, would have chosen to become a different gender, correct? Yeah, correct. And we don't have uh, all these older people who, who now say, oh, you know, my gender was wrong. We have the odd one here and there. But you don't have people who are 50 or 60 years old all of a sudden deciding that, you know, really a, a different gender. You got a couple, you got a couple of them doing that, like Bruce Jenner. <laughs> yeah, you, you have the odd one. But again, yeah. it's fashionable for some of these people to do that, right? But I'm saying it's much more common with young people. That is if my you cousin the, my cousin does it too, and he's about 60. Yeah. But but we could say that it was it's much more fashionable with young people. That is, you could, if you took the number of young people now and you compared it to the number of old people who are transgender, it's definitely way more popular with the young people. So, right. that, means, right. so that means that what you see is, is fashion, right? It's not, it's not a physical reality. Because then all those old people, you know, you would have just as many in that definition. Has happened, but it's way more common with young people than it is with older people, right? Because it's fashionable, right? And older people are much less likely to accept it um, than younger people. Younger people just think that's fine, you know. But you're going to find it harder for older people to accept it. So, so it means it's not something natural. It's something that's just fashionable at the time. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so Samuel says, we've grown up in different societies which have influenced more of our lifestyle, but all in all, we shouldn't make God's name profane, claiming that, that that's how we grew. We have to struggle to get out of Babylon, the world, as we have learned. Yes, so there's many things that we have grown up with, many value systems that, that we have grown up with that are definitely contrary to God's word. Now, you know, I'm blessed in that I was raised in a home that, that didn't just profess to be Christian, but sought to be Christ-like, especially in my mom, right? So she tried to demonstrate Christ's love to everyone around her. Um, and, and so that was a huge influence upon me. And also my brother David becoming a Christian highly influenced me. But... I first tried to be a Christian on the outside until I was converted and recognized that without Christ, I was nothing. Now, it'd be nice to say that, you know, once that happened, that was the end of it, you know, because I've had to be re reconverted as more light has come to me. Because obviously what God showed me when I gave my heart to him um, and asked him to take over my life, I had no idea what I was asking him to do. I had such a limited knowledge of what God's will was. I wasn't a Sabbath keeper. I didn't understand many different things. Um, and I was highly influenced by the world around me, the society as well. So, so all of us have to recognize that it's God's name his character that has to be revealed in us. And in order for us to call people out of Babylon, we have to be out of Babylon. We have to represent Christ. And, and Jones is going to go into that as we go through this study. Um, and it's something that Adventism doesn't want to accept. They don't want this high standard of righteousness. They want to be able to be like the world yet profess to be Christ's. 
Evidence used to used to want the highest standard, you know. Well, yeah, generally, generally, at least they, it seemed on the outside they did. But see, yeah. it's much more acceptable. The lower standard is much more acceptable now. What yeah. we see even in Ella White's day is that uh, many people were fake Christians, fake Adventists. Um, Look at the 1888 message for good. Yeah. Well, that's why the 1888 message was needed. But even then, the yeah. church was able to deflect that message and to claim that we accepted it when it was actually rejected. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to close with prayer unless there's any other comments or observations that people have. Okay. Let's well, pray. Tomorrow is, is tomorrow the... Uh... Canadian group, or I think it's the U.S. group tomorrow, right? It's the U.S. group tomorrow, yeah. Oh, okay. Daniel Fontenot presenting as well. Okay. What? He's not having his meeting in the afternoon. No, he's doing the meeting in the morning. Isn't that what it said? Let me see here. Just hang on. I could be wrong. Um, it says he's the presenter, but he will not have a study in the afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the Sabbath that's coming and for those that are experiencing the Sabbath hours. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you can work in our lives, that you can help us uh, and on this Sabbath especially to spend time with you, to feel your presence, to know that you love us, to receive your blessing, and that we can cooperate with you in the work that you want to do in our lives and those around us. We pray for this movement. We pray for our church. And we just ask, Lord, uh, that your work, your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name.